The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You're back in the House of Mystery. I'm your host today, Al Warren, and Kev Thompson is here as well. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, so uh, before we get into the guest in the show, uh, Chicago, things are looking up. 102 shootings over the July 4th weekend and only 15 fatalities. Uh, means that their skills are dropping. You know, it is a perishable skill. <laughs> they're, they're missing more. I, you know, I, I, I just can't say enough good. I just, I don't know, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and our guest is actually in the Chicago location. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> well, got, with only 15 fatalities, he doesn't have much to worry about. No, but a uh, good place to make movies. So filmmaker uh, John Borowski, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Chicago held the title of murder capital of the U.S. a while back. I don't know if it still is, but, but uh, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's perpetual, you know. What, what? It, it, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I film, sometimes I film, um, you know, these, these huge meetings with, you know, uh, you know, city officials and other people. And, you know, they, they're all, some people are trying, but, you know, it's just that. But what's, what's you know. going on? Like, why is it so high? And every, it seems like every year, like, uh, it, it's been this way for years now, it, it, huge shootings. Yes, and, it has. So what is it yeah. about Chicago? Like, what is it specifically? Uh, is there something going on there that we need to know about? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, and, and it's like this, it, you know, it's basically risen, I think, within the last, I don't know, maybe five to 20 years, you know, because, you know, even when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I didn't hear about all these shootings in Chicago. So, you know, I mean, there is a lot of uh, gang activity, and, you know, I think in the end, these guys are good shots. You know, they, they wind up shooting elderly and children. That's the problem. And these poor people are caught in the crossfire, and they're the victims. You know, in the end, that's what it is. And, and you know, unfortunately, it's, you know, relegated to the south side of Chicago, you know, where, you know, there it's the poorer community, poorer communities, you know, and, and that's where it's all going on. And, and you know, um, you know, you got to get to these kids. My feeling is you got to get to these kids when they're younger, you know, and get them in the after school programs so they're not going out to get involved with games and drugs. And, you know, but again, it's, it's such a huge issue and it doesn't seem like anybody's really trying to do anything about it, you know. And, and to me personally, I feel, okay, you know, you have a lot of these celebrities, you know, you have some celebrities that were from Chicago, obviously, Oprah and some other people, and, you know, but you have all these, you know, African-American celebrities, you know, around the world, too, and, and they're ignoring it, you know, and it seems like, you know, to me, I mean, I remember when when there were the, the black and white police issues happening in L.A., and I remember when Snoop Dogg, you know, took a you know, a whole mass of people and, and walked politely to the sheriff's office and, and had a meeting with them. I never heard of that done by a celebrity. You know, these are the people with money and power. You know, the, the rest of us, we're trying to struggle and we're surviving and, you know, we don't know what we could do about it personally, you know, and yeah. it's, I, you know, I, I'd love to do a documentary on it, but I'm sure people have, and I, I, I'd never find an answer, you know. Yeah. Well, and more people are getting shot there and killed than uh, Afghanistan and stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's like a war zone. It's bad, you know. And again, you know, I, I live on the north side. You know, you, you, you have that occurring here, too, you know. But, it, again, it's, it's really, you know. And, and what's happened also that I've noticed personally, you know, there was always this north side, south side, you know. Uh, and even our sports team, you know, the... The Cubs are north side, the Sox are white uh, south side. So there's always this, you know, north versus south side. But over the last, I think, especially 20, 30 years, the divide between north and south and rich and poor and, and you know, white and African American has even grown more of a divide. And to me, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. And, well, it's a good good atmosphere, I guess, for you to be doing film <laughs> in Syria. Well, you know, <laughs> you know what I always say when I do lectures at, every, at you know, uh, you know, conventions and when I have a speaking engagement? Chicago's the home to 
serial killers, gangsters, and corrupt politicians. <laughs> but really, when you think about it, yeah. it is. You yes. know, I mean, how many governors have been put in prison in the last two or three? Um, you know, uh, the gangster war here with Capone and, uh, you know, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And then you've got, the, all, of course, all these serial killers from Chicago and in the Midwest as well. So... <laughs> I guess it is a good location for me to be in. <laughs> yeah, good, good atmosphere. Now, uh, now there's a couple of things I, I, I've been wanting to talk to you about. I know that um, you have uh, a new film out and uh, called Bloodlines. Uh, th- that was really appealing to me, even though I don't think I like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because this is now this is the life of um, uh, Vincent uh, Castiglia, I guess. I, I, Castiglia. Castiglia. Thank you. Castiglia. And, yeah, and he is now. So, so he's a guy that does tattoos with blood. No. 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 He 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 paints in human blood. It's Exclusively in human blood, he paints on canvas, but he tattoos, you know, with regular ink. He okay. tattoos. He tattooing is kind of like, you know, his kind of day gig. You know, he he takes his art skills and you know makes money uh, by appearing at tattoo conventions and traveling and doing those things while he is creating his art. You know, and uh, so yeah, you know, some people are turned off by you know, even the mention of him painting in blood. You know, I mean, yeah, tattooing in blood would definitely be very strange. That would yeah. be <laughs> <laughs> well, I, when, I, when I saw the scene of him tattooing, and I thought, oh, what's he tattooing in blood? But what's, it's, <laughs> so, let's, so he's doing painting with human blood. Um, whose blood is he using? Well, what he does is, whenever it's his original artworks, he uses his own blood, and he has a nurse or a phlebotomist draw the blood because, you know, once you see the movie, you'll learn more about the reasons why he began painting in blood and how he does it exactly. So I don't want to get too much away, but he, he does have a nurse or a phlebotomist draw his blood. You know, when we began, um, you know, it, talking about me producing a film on, you know, him and his art, you know, I had learned that he had painted... Uh, people's portraits in their blood, like Margaret Cho, he had painted in her blood, so her blood was drawn, and then he painted her portrait in her blood, and um, he had done a whole uh, white guitar in the blood of Gary Holt uh, for the band Slayer. He's the guitarist for Slayer. So now he's doing more of these personalized pieces where he will draw the collector's blood and paint an image for them. And so when we first started talking about this film, I said, okay, look, you know, I, 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 you know, I want to make this film, but, you know, I want my portrait painted in my blood. So we agreed on that as well as as part of the process. So the first time I visited visited in New York, I sat down and get a nurse that drew 13 vials of my blood. And he painted my portrait, and it's like two feet by three feet, large painting all of my blood and these things could take him a month to do. Wow. And well yeah. I, I guess they could always uh you know in the future, um after you're dead they can always take your painting and get your DNA and maybe do a clone. Right. <laughs> exactly. I know. I mean, you know, this 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 pain, this painting of me and and Vincent's paintings and the other people you know, uh, his collectors that the paintings are done in their blood, you know, it is. It's, it's part of their DNA. It's a part of them. You know, it's part of their tissue, which is very interesting, you know. And, and some people are turned off when they hear about what he's doing, but then I, I explain it a little more. And, you know, when you see his final artworks, you would never know. They just look like sepia artworks. But, you know, they are beautiful. They're not just, you know, paint, uh, blood dripped on a canvas. You know, he, you know, he does different shades, and again, when you see the film, you learn how, but, you know, there's tones and shades, and there's, he uses the white space of the canvas as negative space, so he kind of has to, and, you know, he can't correct it, there's no white out, he doesn't, you know, he only uses blood, so he has to have this total vision on this canvas before he starts, it's a very difficult process, and again, once you see the documentary, you don't know why, but, uh, 
It's, uh, I was fascinated by it. I was a fan of his. And so I think it was 2013, 2014, we were both fans and friends on Facebook, and he had posted something uh, asking people if you should do a reality show. And, you know, of course, the typical reaction from people were, oh, yeah, that's great, cool, yeah, that would be so good. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, wrote his, I wrote a long comment, and I said, you know, I think it would actually do a disservice to you because, you know, I know what these reality shows are like. They want to cause conflict. They're scripted. They're not really reality shows. You know, and I said, in the end, you might wind up looking like a fool. You might get some publicity, but once the show is done, who's going to remember that show 20 years from now or 100 years from now? I told him that, you know, you deserve a documentary, that focuses on your entire art and your life and what brought you to this point that will last hundreds of years, that people could watch us and say, wow, this, these are the beginnings of a, you know, a, a phenomenal artist, you know, like a future Giger or a Dolly or a Michelangelo. I mean, Margaret Cho compared him to Michelangelo. Again, when you see his works, plus the medium he works in, it's just it's fascinating. Wow. Wow. I, I, I guess next they'll be using brain matter and... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Probably. Maybe they'll uh, grind intestines down and, you know, <laughs> pick guts and brains and who knows. But, but again, you know, it, it's, you know, it's definitely personal. And, again, there's a reason for it. I, I, like I said, I don't want to get too much of it from the way. But, you know, he, he's uh, big in with, obviously, the heavy metal crowd because, he does, you know, he did the Slayer guitar and those people know him and he's done commission artworks. And um, his first... Uh, major show was at the uh, Giger Museum in Switzerland. So, you know, Giger took him kind of under his wing, and, you know, we filmed at Giger's studio and uh, at the museum, and he, Giger had passed away a year before I was out there, and I could have met him, you know, he was like an idol of mine, of course, because he did the creature Alien and all these other artworks and Poltergeist 2, the movie, and, you know, uh, Species, you know, just a phenomenal, phenomenal artist. And you see these artworks that he did in Airbrush. They're huge panels, you know, probably like four foot by eight foot high and that you put paint, like three of these panels together and it's like a whole wall that you could get lost in this whole universe that then called mainly black and white and did some color works too. But, you know, there's, you know, that's why this film is so fascinating. You know, it runs about 91 minutes. We do have a distributor now, so it's going to be out on November 13th. It'll be released streaming in DVD, and uh, we're still working out all the exacts on that. And um, But just, uh, you know, Margaret Cho's in the film. Greg Allman, who passed away last year, you know, of the Allman Brothers band, he owns a piece of Vincent's art. He said when he heard it was created in blood, he had to have it. So he's in the film, and Slayer's in the film, and Lamb of God, and, you know, art critics, and we have, you know, uh, <laughs> Salvador Dali's interior designers in the film. So, you know, we have all these different people. It's not just gore or heavy metal. I mean, Tony Timpone from Fangoria, you know, is in it. So there, there, there's horror, there's art, there's uh, life, there's death, you know, and, and what Vincent had gone through to, to kind of, come to this point where he was peeing in blood and, and all the, you know, awful things that have kind of happened in his life that you have to see the movie on now. So, now, okay, so you, uh, when when are people going to be able to see it? Well, yeah, November 13th, I mean, the, we are having some screening now, like, you know, there's some festivals that I'm talking to and, you know, some screenings are occurring between now and November, but uh, the the next screening is going to be August, I believe it's August 4th, 3rd or 4th, at Flashback, the horror convention here in Chicago. And uh, they're going to screen it there. So it isn't released yet. November 13th is the official release date. So then uh, that's the date it will be on DVD and stream. Now, are you um, uh, trying to stream um, through anybody but Amazon? No, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a strange situation out for indie filmmakers, and I don't know what happened this year, but this year, especially literally starting this beginning of July of this year, strange things have happened all over with the Internet and streaming and regulations. Very weird. You know, again, I'm not privy to a lot of these things. I know there were the uh, 
to be, you know, there was this internet regulation thing that I don't know if it went through or whatever, but there was that. But um, for the last two or three years, Amazon was really the savior of indie filmmakers. You know, what they were doing was allowing indies to upload their work directly and not deal with the distributor and paying us directly. And, you know, as long as your film had closed captioning, you could do that. And it was great. I mean, for me, it was, it was let's just say it was amazing. It allowed me to, you know, get paid what I deserve, but yet I could concentrate on my work without having to drive an Uber or, you know, work a day job. So it was awesome. And then I, of course, I had deals from Netflix for like the last seven, eight years. Netflix picked up every movie I had. They, you know, distributed it and streaming. It was out there. And H.H. H. Holmes, they had um, picked that up for seven years straight. You know, the other ones, they would come and go, you know, whenever they could license my other right. films for a year or two. But Holmes was on it for, but this year, beginning of this year, Netflix said, no, we're not showing Holmes anymore. Really? No, we're not interested that's, in that, yeah. that's where I saw it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean it was you know, here's what I heard for an order for Netflix to renew films, I think it they had to hit at least a million or a hundred million views or whatever. So Holmes was a big hit for them. And it, I'm sure it still would be. But you know, they're having budgetary issues because their money is going to original content. They told me this directly. They refused to pick up my new movie. Even the bloodlines, even though we had a relationship for the last eight years, losing income from that, losing income from all my other titles that they're not picking up. And then Amazon dropped a bombshell this March saying, starting July 1st, we're cutting all royalties by more than half. They were offering 15 cents an hour before, which wasn't too bad. They cut it from 15 cents to 6 cents an hour. How, how do they do that? Get in they could do it because they're Amazon. <laughs> you know, they said, hey, well, if you, read, if you read our, you know, um, policies, you know, you'll see that, you know, we require a two to three month notice for, given when any changes are to be occurred. And that's what they do. You know, they cover themselves legally. So that's what it was. So in March, they told everybody, okay, by July, every, you're going to be cut. And that's what it is. So now, you know, of course, me and many other creators are scrambling, and, you know, it's not a good situation. You know, it, you know, it's strange because us indies, I see it, we kind of almost built those platforms. Because, you know, when Netflix started, they had a lot of indie stuff, and Amazon Prime as well. They, you know, they, they had a lot of really interesting indie stuff, and they're kind of like throwing us out now, yeah. especially Netflix. I was really surprised by that and, and the fact that, you know, they didn't pick up Bloodlines. They told me it was too small of a film. And I said, really? With Greg Allman and Margaret Cho and Slayer and all these Damien Echols, big names in this? Is too small of a film? Yeah. So they just want to work with the big boys. It doesn't matter. They don't, I, you know, I'm still a little guy. I could get De Niro in my movie. They're still not going to pick it up, literally. Yeah. Well, That's what, how it is. What, what, what about the others, like the, uh, like the smaller ones that are starting up, like Crackle and all those other ones? Is there is there hope there? There might be. You know, I'm working. I have a new distributor now that I'm working with on Bloodlines, and I'm going to see, you know, what develops with this new distributor. You know, Hulu was interested in Bloodlines with a different distributor, but they weren't offering that much. It was kind of more of an insult. So I, I said, no, let's, I put that on the back burner. Now I have a new distributor. But, you know, it depends on you know, if, number one, how much per hour view these other streaming, you know, platforms are paying, plus, you know, are people actually, you know, how many people are, you know, being drawn to those platforms as well, you know, because, of course, Amazon, you had the built-in, you know, crowd there, Yeah. you know. Yeah. But Amazon shot themselves in the foot, you know, here's what I think happened. People ask, well, what happened? Why did they do that? Why did they cut them in half? Well, here's what I think happened. They started with a good idea, but, you know, they, they probably thought that by having people close caption their work, that would deter people from uploading home movies and family and, you know, whatever, right? But they, that didn't. So I think their servers were inundated, which they have to pay for. So, you know, believe me, they would have been smarter 
if they had said, look, we're going to charge every India fee to, to have this service, I would have gladly paid 2000 or more a year for what I was getting. I would have gladly paid that. But they, you know, so now it, it's kind of I collapsed, and, you know, they don't even give anybody a reason or that's actually what happened. But I, I believe that's what happened. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's just it's a very strange time, you know. And, yeah. Well, you they're know, doing it, a... It, it, they're doing a lot of strange things. Uh, for example, if you order too many items and return too many items, they'll just cancel your membership. See that right? And you know, it's I mean, very no strange. warning. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's not right too. I just cancel it. I mean, you get a refund because you have to pay for the whole year. Or I don't know how all that goes. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's really strange times. I think YouTube did the same thing. I was, you know, I never was paid. To have my films on YouTube, well, I was through distributors, but I had never done it directly because you had to have something like 20,000 followers or a huge amount of followers to, to start charging people to view your work on YouTube. But YouTube did that this year as well. You know, they, they cut rates for people, you know, that have their films on there, filmmakers, and I don't know what's going on this year or what caused it, but, you know, this, I'm hoping in the next year or two, there is a, a company like Amazon or someone else that will come in and, and help us. But, you know, what's going to happen between now and then, I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm struggling. I have books out, too, and, you know, I, I, I'm working on a couple other books. And Bloodlines is coming out in November. But, you know, it it just all takes time and, and time and money. And in the past, I was able to self-fund my films with the money that, you know, of course I've received from, you know, streaming and sales and everything, but if there, if there isn't money coming in from the film, it's kind of difficult or impossible for me to make a film, or it's just plain insanity, you know, to, yeah. to make a film knowing that the profit is going to be nowhere near what you're putting into it. So I don't know. I mean, I hope it gets better, but right now, you know, I don't foresee myself making any more films. And that's sad. I've been doing this for 20 years. But at, right now, I can't do it anymore. I can't make it. Yeah. You'll be down to driving Uber again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. You know, and even that, you, and that yeah. will pay the bills. Not, I can't make movies with that, you know. And yeah. So it's tough, you know. But, but that's always, and, you know, there are these ebbs and flows. Because, you know, when DVD, when H.H. H. Holmes was first released on DVD, that was near the, kind of near the end of DVD beginning of streaming, when streaming was starting to come in to play, you know, like 2004, whatever it was. And what I would make in the first three months of DVD sales now, it takes me at least to take, make two years on stream. That's how long it takes. That, so that gives you an idea. Three months of DVD sales versus two years of streaming, both equal the same amount. So that even, you know, even being paid well by streaming is nowhere compared to DVD. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, and, and now with Best Buy, you know, not carrying CDs anymore and, you know, the DVDs, are, are they going to disappear too? I mean, I don't know. It's, I always say you can't give, how fun is it to give a gift card? You can't give an MP3 as a gift and autograph it. You know, you need something physical. You can't collect MP3s. It's, yeah. you know, if collectors need DVDs, uh, and, you know, and, and when I go to conventions, I autograph them and, and, you know, personalize them with people. So, I don't know who knows what's going to happen, but, you know, this mindset of streaming is the end-all, save-all isn't, you know, Netflix and, and some of these other channels, they don't have a great selection. I just, I type in classic horror films, and there's nothing classic there. There's nothing right. good there. Yeah, yeah. You know? They're they're kind of going for the for the mainstream, the big, big stuff now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so, you know, now I released season two of my latest TV show, yeah, Serial Stories TV. Oh, man, you know, and so this is the first show or, you know, uh, you know, a visual piece that I put on Amazon since their changes. And, it, you know, I'm doing that, obviously, because I'm in with Amazon already, and it's, it's kind of working. But, you know, obviously, I'm working with new distributors, so things may change. And I, so I am working with Amazon, even though I'm not happy with them. But, you know, even though they're paying half of what they had paid before, it's still income. So right now, I have to keep going with that and look at other options, you know, because, again, this did happen, you know, with DVD, 
when the transfer from DVD to streaming, I was all distraught. But then, you know, Netflix came in, and Netflix was doing good, and Hulu would buy my work too sometimes. But now we're going through another change, you know. So seven, eight years later, it's another change. So hopefully this is just a hump to get over. But it was so interesting. My, the first season of Serial Killer Culture TV I released last year, beginning of 2017, on Amazon Prime, and I released self-released on DVD. Well, this year, I think it was, it was April or May that I had uploaded the Masters to Amazon Prime for the season two of the show. I didn't hear from them for like a month or two, and I kept asking them what's going on, you know, why it's taking so long, because, you know, they don't even give you a release date. It's like, oh, well, your movie, your movie or, or show could go live in two days or two months, and you don't know when. Yeah. And they don't even have the courtesy to tell you. Like, I found out from other people when my show was live. Amazon didn't even say, okay, now it's live. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> I can't even do a release date. You know, I can't do a proper release with it on Amazon. So then they finally got back to me, you know, before it was approved, the season two, and they said, well, you know, our new policies are you have to change the name and artwork of your show because we cannot have TV in the title. Oh. They don't get a reason. Okay. But then I'm thinking, Maybe well, okay. well, right, exactly. But but then I'm thinking, well, for a whole year, the first season has been branded serial killer culture TV. I mean, you know, they would never tell Paramount Pictures to go back and change Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, you know, once you brand the title, this is branded. And so I had to change it. In, in order for season two to be up, I had to change the title. Of course, I wasn't going to change the the, the graphics on the actual, you know, shows themselves. I would, I would just pull them if that's the case and just put them on DVD or whatever. But, you know, I had to change it to Serial Killer Culture, the web series, which is, I mean, it's no big deal. But, you know, again, when you have something branded that's in the public eye for a year, now you have to change the first season, the name of the first season, and the, it's just, but to me, people say, ah, no, it's not against Indies. You no, know, it's, I think it is. I think it is because, I've heard these stories. I've heard Amazon coming down and indie filmmakers saying, you can't have gratuitous nudity anymore, blah, blah, blah. But yet they have movies like Irreversible that has a 13-minute rape scene, yeah. you know, unflinching rape scene. It's okay for them because they're the big boys. It happens all the time. You know, YouTube did that to me recently. There was a, um, uh, it was some sort of a, one of these, I don't know, companies that make these short videos. 10, you know, weirdest blah, blah, blah. And they had 10, you know, uh, 10, mo 10 uh, last words of executed criminals. Oh, yeah, like Watch Mojo yeah. or one of those. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it was. And they just felt free to not even ask me, not contact me, just pull parts of my film on Carl Panzram and put it in there. Just do it. And, and they did put a little bit of credit at the beginning, but they never asked me. And it's like, okay, I, you know, I'm not a big company. I put my own money into these things you know, my time and, and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. And for people to do that, it's, it's kind of irritating because I know they're making millions off of it, and I know I'm, <laughs> I'm not making anywhere near that on my movies. So, you know, and then it's this big thing, and I contact YouTube, and they say it's, it's uh, free, fair use. Well, like I said, they wouldn't do it. That's because Watch Mojo is it's all about money. They're getting hand-in-hand, -hand and, and everyone's getting a cut of this, you know, 10 million views or whatever, somebody's making money off of it. But, you know, and then I had to fight with YouTube, I had to fight with the company, and then the company was going to sue me, even though it's my thing, and say, well, we know this is fair use. So it got to a point where it's like, okay, well, what do I do? You know, do I give up? Do I try and fight them? And it got to a point where, you know, I kind of agreed with a friend of mine. He said, well, you know, if, if it's less effort, just ask them if they could extend the credit showing that it's your movie over the entire piece, which they did in the end, but it's still like, you know, I don't get anything more to be done than that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the unfortunate thing about the uh, access of the Internet and streaming, right? It just it opens yeah. it up, and it's hard to keep it in control. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, you know, I mean, the, the season two is up now, and I'm going to be... Uh, creating the DVD for it as well. Yeah.
So what season two? Tell 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 the listeners a little bit what it what it's about. What they're what they're going to get. Yeah, season two again. It's the same format as season one, where I call it intimate interviews with individuals that are involved in the serial killer culture. You know, you're not going to get something like a, uh, you know, 2020 or a History Channel thing with, you know, cuts every two seconds and, you know, uh, crazy edits. It's not about that. It's as if you're sitting down with people involved in the serial killer culture. There are mentions of serial killers on the show, but it's really more about the culture involved around serial killers and the people that are involved in this culture, whether they're authors, whether it's the museum. Uh, it could be a murder dealia collector. Um, you know, there, it's such a broad topic and that I thought, okay, this would be really cool because when I was making a film on serial killer culture, I had known a lot of people involved, you know, musicians like Merle Allen and the Murder Junkies and Macabre, you know, bands that do songs on serial killer. So I was like, wow, you know, there's mm-hmm. books, there's music, there's paintings. You know, there, it, there's so much that I could do on a show, and I think people would find this interesting as well as, you know, authors such as yourself that write and, and deal with criminals and murderers and rapists and serial killers, people want to know what, what you go through. You know, what is it like writing to them? Do they, you know, Amanda Howard, who's an author from Australia, she was on uh, the show from this season. She said it was interesting that one of these cannibals sent her a recipe, and she was the ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> she was for Jambalaya. She's reading it. She's okay, you know. But then she comes to the end, and it's Amanda Howard. <laughs> so, you know, these, these people because you know people don't experience these things on a day to day basis, like I might or you might or other authors or people involved, you know, that own this serial killers or or whatever the case may be. And you know, I, I thought it was you know, a great opportunity for me to create a show that's contemporary rather than my other films, which, you know, like the historical horror trilogy, I call them, which, you know, were about biographies on these past serial killers. These are more contemporary. So um, this season, it's six episodes again, and uh, the first one is Channeling Manson, and it is starring Michael Channels, who was a friend of Charles Manson's. He would talk to him on the phone, he would go visit him, he would collect artifacts from him, but he was an actual friend of Manson's for about 20 or 30 years, so he has a lot to say on the topic. And also in the episode, um, Channel shows us a lot of his collection and, and, of course, talks about his friendship with Manson. But he also takes us on a tour of the Spawn Ranch location where it was. And that was really interesting. I didn't know what I was in for. Yeah. I'm glad I did work to choose because you're, I was going downhill, uphill, you know, through all these weird paths. And it was definitely very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the second episode is My Friend Gacy, which stars Barry Vichelli, who wrote a book about being John Wayne Gacy's childhood friend. He grew up with John Wayne Gacy here on the northwest side of Chicago. And uh, just a fascinating man, and, you know, he's on camera crying about how he has PTSD, how, you know, he really loved his friend when, when they were friends, but how, you know, he had to realize the fact that, you know, he killed these 33 young men, and, you know, he had, you know, these huge issues. He had to go in therapy, and he felt nightmares about it. So, again, I think... The show is important because it shows us how many other people, you know, serial killers can affect other than just the murderer, the victim, and the families of of those two parties. There are so many other people that deal with these stories. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many layers to that, you know. Um, Yeah, yeah. We we were just talking about the Golden State Killer and had an interview and stuff like that. And just uh, just think of the fallout that's going to have. For for him now that they've caught him, and all of his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know his family too. They're going to have to go through, and I mean we've seen it over and over again with people like me mm-hmm. and uh, Dennis Rader and, and many of these people. And you know they're either shot and or you know they're in denial. You know and that happens a lot too. Well, like BTK, he was just the average family man. His family yeah. never suspected. Nope. 
No, nope, yeah, and imagine that bomb dropping on you, where, you know, here's your father or your husband or your wife, or, I mean, it's, you could see how traumatic it would be. Um, and then the next episode, the third one is Bumped by a Monster, which I believe, you know, you know uh, author Peter Bronski, and you worked with him before, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He published yeah, two yeah, of he, books. He, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so he talks about how he bumped into Richard Cottingham in the Hotel in New York and talks about other serial killers. He also met Chickatillo at, at one point before Chickatillo was apprehended. Um, so he tells us some of these stories and, you know, his researches. Um, yeah, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, he's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We, we had him on, and he was just talking about the the four Fs of serial killer, and oh, you yes. have to keep beeping out the one because you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I love that. I yeah. love it. When I first met him in Canada to film him to interview him, he was living in this whole building, which is now demolished. They demolished this whole area, but you know, he had that office for a long time, and he showed me like this is like H.H. Holmes's castle. He would go in, in his work, come out another one, go downstairs, come out the back. He's like, it was like a maze, you know. He's running around. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's um, had a and then, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. You know, and, and you know, again, these, these show segments are around, you know, 20, 25 minutes. But, you know, maybe in the future I might look at expanding them. Uh, people don't get too bored with them. But, you know, people do want more. You know, some of my worries are that, you know, that they're, you know, going to get bored of sitting and watching one person, but I think the subject matter is fascinating. And like I said, it's almost as if you're sitting with this person and they're sitting to tell you their stories without being edited by, you know, a, a poor sound bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, another episode is Infamous Bathory, where author Kim Kraft talks about her book called Infamous Lady, which is all about the myths and legends of Elizabeth Bathory. Did she mm-hmm. bathe in blood? Was she a vampire? No, no, no. <laughs> you know, and, uh, her book. <laughs> her book is phenomenal. I don't know if you checked it out, but you know, it, it's it's really amazing. And, you know, uh, you know, she found you know many of the writings of Bathory and these original texts that she had to you know uh, uh, translate. And uh, you know, again, just another one of these you know, historical stories that, you know, people, uh, you know, believe in these sort of things. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, what, what was uh, another one we, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, what, what is, what was the most shocking one that uh, a person you've met in true crime that you've been uh, lucky enough to interview, I guess I would say? Well, see, and that's the thing, shocking that, it, that's difficult to, to think because I, I never really, I haven't met a serial killer. I haven't, you know, I, I've had, you know, some strange experiences. You know, I was involved in the DTK case a little, the base of peanut my records, but, you know, nothing nothing like that. You know, I mean, a lot of these people are kind of like, uh, you know, almost like rock stars, like jo- Joe Coleman or Merle Allen, you know, very interesting people where, you know, both of them, their homes and their apartments were very, pretty much everything serial killer or oddities. Well, Merle Allen's home were all serial killers. Like, I think he sold some of his stuff by now, but when I filmed them for the first season, I mean, every inch of wall space was covered with some kind of serial killer artifact, postcard, memento. Even his kitchen counter was covered with all the serial killer trading cards. You know, you would have wall space, you know, that were just big enough for postcards or all serial killer postcards. Literally, every inch of wall space you looked around was serial killer related material or his band, you know, the murder junkies. And Joe Coleman's little auditorium was kind of the same way, you know, just covered with, you know, uh, writings from serial killers or paintings from them or strange artifacts and oddities. You know, when I filmed them for Albert Fish, he said, see that over there? And I, you know, it looked like a little mole in, in, a, in a cross. He's like, that's a piece of Jesus. That's, that's Jesus' flesh in there. And I said, oh, really? He's like, I'm like, well, how do you know that? He's like, well, I don't know if you believe it. So, you know, it goes with the whole dime museum thing and the whole gap. And, you know, I, but 
that's what I mean. You know, I, I, I could have been, you know, sitting in a cubicle for, you know, my life, you know, working in an office, but in a way I'm very lucky that I've met such interesting people, you know, that, you know, whether they're authors or filmmakers or collectors and, uh, you know, just uh, fascinating, you know, people. And, and I, I'd like to do a whole season of the show where it's maybe like all female, you know, re- female people involved, you know, in, in the culture. You know, the, there's the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast, you know, of course we have Catherine Brown, <laughs> who's another author. You know, there's all these strange things. There's so much to cover. But, you know, if I had a budget, it would be amazing. You know, I can be more of these and do it quicker. Yeah. Well, so, what, um, what do you attribute the fascination to? I mean, it, this goes beyond fascination. It's almost obsession, yeah. but what do you attribute that to? Mine or other people's? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> mine, it was, mine, it was always the love of horror films and just the macabre and strange things. I mean, my whole life isn't like that. I don't live that way. I mean, you look at me and you never know. You know, I hardly wear black. It's not about that, but I've always been interested in the strange and unusual, you know. But, uh, you know, other people, I think, it's, I think it's the same way, too. They probably got started out with horror films, and, you know, it just compounded into this real-life, you know, factor of, you know, this is real. It's like reality horror in a sense that these are real people doing these things, you know. And, and I always say that, you know, I, I kind of, you know, uh, wish I wouldn't have called H.H. H. Holmes a monster because, you know, after making films and studying psychology of serial killers and abnormal psychology that, you know, these people are still human once they're apprehended. You know, they don't turn into monsters. You know, they're still people. And they're, and I figure it's our job to, to, you know, try and find out why they're doing these things or what causes it, you know, and we still don't know. But um, I think that's what it is, you know. And, and in the old days, it must have been different. You know, like imagine when Joe Coleman or Rick Staten or Merle Allen, when they were writing these killers, those were different times. You know, now, you could go on the Internet and see a letter by these killers. You could see their dead body or their victim. It's all, everything's on the Internet. You know, try to imagine whatever 30 years ago before the Internet, you know, it it was even more shocking because, like, that's when, you know, I was starting to get into this stuff. And, you know, now I'm sure, you know, uh, maybe people aren't faced by it. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. People get more more accustomed to uh, to the to the gore and the violence, and uh, yeah. uh, they probably have a time separating reality from fiction too, as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, and uh, it's you know, and it's endless. You know, there are just so many cases, and, and there are so many facets to it as well. You know, not just there's the forensic aspect psychological aspect, the detective work, you know, and, and that's why, you know, I'm fascinated by the earlier cases because of the intimacy of these, you know, tools and techniques that were being used and limitations, you know, and then some of them, I, it was almost impossible that they actually apprehended these people, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'm fascinated by that, you know, I, I'm still, I still want to complete my film on Jesse Conway that I'm producing. And, you know, it was the same thing. It was 1874, and they had to telegraph another police station in the next district to see if this, you know, boy was released from one school. And, you know, again, just these the strange tools and techniques they had at that time and, and how, you know, some of these serial killers slipped through their hands for so long because of the lack of those crime detection techniques. Well, mm-hmm. and that was when oh. they used to wash down the crime scene. Yes. Yeah. Right. Now, now all they need is 23 and me. So. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think that they're going to catch a lot of people that from the old times now that committed serial crimes like Zodiac with things like the DNA? You know, they might. I mean, you know, the Golden State Killer is a perfect example. Who would have ever thought that they would have, you know, and... and I still don't know all the exact details. Wasn't it through a DNA from Ancestry.com or like you were looking into the Ancestry? Or, yeah, it was, it was 23 and me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he, yeah. he found out that he's 15% Scottish and 75% serial killer. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That's the telling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then, the, yeah, they went through both of them and they, and um, basically found his, 
his mitochondrial, you know, the the mother's DNA, and then they staked out some of his family, and one thing led to another, and uh, there you go. I, I, yeah, you know, it's um, getting. It could be, you know, it could be. It, it could be possible. I mean, I, you know, who knows? I mean, I I don't know what you know. I always believe it's luck and skill for everything. You know, they have to be skilled, but they're kind of lucky too to, to you know, come across these things or hunt them down or find them or, you know, it's just like me when I do my research for my film, but, you know, stuff. And as times go, time goes by, it's harder for me to find information on cases that are from so long ago, you know, because the information gets lost or destroyed or accidentally disappears or people steal it or whatever the case is. And, you know, who knows? That that, stuff like that is very fascinating. You know, and, and <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it would be interesting. You know, I mean, yeah. that's why I've never personally been interested in the unsolved cases because I'm more interested in the cases where somebody is apprehended, where we can study them, or maybe if they're going to tell the truth, hear their point of view for the reasons why they did these things. Yeah. But, uh, you know, now we might find out who the axe man of New Orleans is, and like you said, Zodiac and some of these other materials. That would be cool to get Jack the Ripper once and for all. <laughs> oh, that would be great. That would be great, you know. Just, it, I don't know, try. man. <laughs> Every, there's going to be so many disappointed people. Yeah. I mean, that's... I yeah, you know, know, well, like I said, I, I just wish I would have, you know, said he, uh, he was H.H. Holmes before other people did, so I would have... I would have had a ton of publicity. Well, could, don't you don't you have a relative you can blame for all of it? <laughs> right, I know. I got to look into my history. Yeah, I, there's, there's, there might be somebody somewhere. There might be somebody. <laughs> it just, just, I mean, we just did the Ed Edwards again, and that was just crazy. Uh, he's he's done oh, Joan yeah. Benet Ramsey now, and Lacey Peterson, and right. It, well, it's just, yeah. you know, it gets crazy. It gets just beyond reality oh yeah oh yeah yeah it's you know it's it's interesting you know and again you know you have all these you know uh cases too that you know are made into these documentary series whether it's not a serial killer like that i was fascinated by that show the staircase you know that whole movie series and you know just these other cases like where these strange things happen we may never know the how you know the murder at or accidents, or whatever it was, actually occurred, you know. Like, there was that owl theory, you know, and I, I thought that was fascinating, because I couldn't, in my mind, of course, I don't have a PhD in these things, but I've studied them probably like you guys have, but I couldn't figure in that, that staircase how she could have had those damages, and then when the owl theory came forward, I'm like, well, that makes more sense than anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, you know crazy things yeah. can happen, and we just don't it's expect crazy. them, you know. Right, exactly. You know, we, and, and now, of course, you have a lot of these armchair forensics people that think, oh, yeah, you know, it was the husband. He beat her over the head. It's the gun deal. But it's like, okay, but you're not, you know, I'm not an expert. You're not an expert. So how can you do that? When the, how can you say that when the experts, you know, aren't even able to prove that? It was H.H. H. Like, okay, Holmes. Oh. <laughs> of course. That's the easy thing to do. I should say that. That'll get us some publicity. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Just blame it on and and say it was like a distant relative. It was my yeah, my home. great great grandfather's cousin. Yeah, he was. Yeah, great. I could get my whole whole mini series. Yeah, that's right. It was. Oh well, you know, like I said, that John Cameron's got that one on Paramount now, and and every show is about who he killed, and it's everybody. Yeah. You know, but the yeah. thing is, I was in, not that I have a lot of hair, but I was just in a, at a hair shop here the other day, and all the girls are running over because they know I, I do the show, and they, they're like, so what do you think of that? Ed Edwards killed all those people, and he was Zodiac too, hey? <laughs> and it's like, well, <laughs> no, I, I don't know that. It's just, there's no right. evidence. Right. Exactly. And, and I get that, too. And, you know, I, I want to sit down with these people and say, or I do tell them, I say, you know, do you have about 24 to 48 hours where we can discuss this? We probably don't have that much time right now. Because, <laughs> you know, you can't. You yeah. can't sum it up in a sentence. You know, yes or no, you can't. 
Yeah. Like, well, uh... <laughs> yeah, this is kind of like, oh, I heard he killed Lacey Peterson. Can you believe that? And it's like, well, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> shot and then shot JR. Yeah. yeah, it's just yeah, about that bad. Right. Yeah, that, that's the other bad thing about the Internet, too. You know, I, I don't know if I mentioned it to you before, but, you know, this was years ago that, you know, someone had put out there that, oh, yeah, you know, Albert Fish, he was electrocuted by those needles in the electric chair, and he, he shorted out the electric chair by those needles inside him. And, you know, I mean, I I told them, I, I showed them proof of the book where his executioner wrote nothing unusual happened. Here's the guy that pulled the switch who was standing probably 10, 20 feet away from him. But they still like to believe the urban niche that, nah, you're wrong. I don't yeah. believe you. <laughs> okay. Well, you believe what you want, then I, I yeah. can't argue with you. They, they don't want to, you know, then, and, and, if, and if the uh, witness like that is um, strong, then then they have to cut him down. You know, then they'll say, right. well, you know, he, he beat his wife or he... <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> we can't trust them. You know, it's it's, right. it, it's it's crazy. You can't win, and it's all about feelings. I feel that they don't like someone, so they feel he's this is what he, you know. He must have been guilty. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, guest has been uh, indie filmmaker. I'll just say filmmaker John Borowski. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. To find out more, to find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.